open your lives to the presence of the living Christ in this place. As we worship, the presence of God shall be known to us. In John's gospel, Jesus describes rivers of living water that flow out from within. This image of living water is a way of talking about God's gifts, gifts of grace and forgiveness that don't just trickle out, don't come just with a drop here or drop there, but are poured out with such amazing abundance. May those of us that have gathered here this day open our lives to those wonderful gifts being poured into our lives. Let us begin our time of worship. was our call to call to worship. <laughs> please join with me in our call to worship, please. From the waters of creation, the earth sprang forth. From the waters of the edge of Egypt, God liberated a people. From the waters of a river, people emerged from their baptisms, marked as beloved children. Praise be to God, whose life-giving gift refreshes our soul. Praise be to God, whose love is abundant and transformative. Praise, Praise be to God. God. Please stand as you're able and join with us in our first hymn. Join with me in our opening prayer. 
Gracious God, make each one of us an instrument of your grace. Allow for the beautiful image of baptism to be an instrument by which we discover and embrace the grace gifted by you. We call on you, Lord, to enter, gather us in your spirit. Lead us again and again into life-giving and soul-infusing encounters with your waters. In the name of Jesus, who spoke of himself as living water, we give thanks this day. Amen. Cypress Creek. Good it's good to see each and every one of you here this morning, especially good to see those of you who may be visiting with us. We hope before you leave today that you'll stop by our visitor's kiosk. Also take advantage of that blue card to let us know that you are present and if there's anything that we can do to minister to you. All of you, I remind you of that blue card, an excellent way of communicating with your church family and your church staff should you have any prayer requests, prayer concerns, or anything else that you need for others to know. But it's good to be here. It's good to be gathered together in worship. It's good to experience the love and the power of God's Spirit in our midst. And let's take a moment to greet one another and our guests. Well, good morning, church. It is good to be together. For community is such an important part of our Christian experience. It is here that we hear the vision and mission set out for this congregation to put love first in all things. It is here that we find strength to live out that calling for it is a challenge to put love first in all things. And yet that is who we claim to be here at Cypress Creek Christian Church. I do want to reiterate what Mark said about the blue cards. Please let us know how we can pray for you at the communion time. You'll have a chance to place them in the baskets up front. Unless you're thinking about joining and then we say keep a hold of the blue card and you can give it to me, you can give it to one of our elders at the close of the service. Last Sunday in my sermon, if you were not here, I talked about something a bit odd, commercial cricket farming, and talked about how there are some, actually many in the world, who eat insects as a central part of their diet. And because we have a few people with a good sense of humor here in our church, they ordered crickets. Um, I know there was salt and vinegar, there was uh, honey roasted, I think, and one other. And they had them over in holy grounds between the donuts and the granola. But I understand they all were eaten, which I think is impressive. But I say that in part, I appreciate a congregation with a sense of humor. And I appreciated the few people that... Got a little grossed out by it, but still understood why it had been done. I lift up Tuesday night at 6.45. We have a meeting of the adult discipleship team. 
If you are part of that team, we encourage you to be there. But we also say if that is of interest to you and would like to come and be a part of the process, please come. We'll be meeting over in the activity room. Wednesday night, we'll be having our first meeting in preparation for the blessing of the animals. That is a wonderful event that happens on the first Saturday of October, remembering St. Francis of Assisi, who, who is about blessing all of creation, including animals. And so people bring their dogs, their cats, their snakes, their critters up here to the church that Saturday, and we give blessing to them. It's a wonderful event for our church, but it's also an event that we open up to the broader community. So again, we'll be pr uh, preparing. Uh, preparing for that this Wednesday evening. I want to welcome back, they're all over in the youth building right now, but welcome back our youth mission team. They were off on their mission trip all this week, but I want to give up a special thank you to Kevin and Jennifer Warman, along with Mariah, our uh, youth director, and Josh, our summer intern, who went as the adult sponsors uh, for that amazing week. And I've already heard uh, a lot of the good stuff coming back from it. Today, we are about two and a half years into our five-year crossing over campaign. When I first came to Cypress Creek about five years ago, we were about $2.7 million in debt. We, uh, at that time, were paying interest only on our mortgage. And I'm not really good with numbers, but if you have a 20-year mortgage and you're only paying interest, it doesn't mean, it means you don't have a 20-year mortgage anymore. You just keep on pushing it further and further out. Well, in the last two and a half years, we have paid down more than a million dollars in that mortgage. And that is something to for us to give thanks to God for, but I also give thanks to you all for being committed to this idea that we shouldn't just pay interest only, but we should try to bring a close to this debt. For in fact, Cypress Creek Christian Church has been in debt for 40 straight years as it has built different buildings. And I think it's time for us to be free of that. So I give thanks to that. And I add that it wasn't just about paying down the debt. There were other small things. We have like 37 air conditioning units on our property, most of them between 20 and 35 years of age. And we had no plan of replacing those. And this has allowed us to begin replacing the older units with something that is more efficient and will ultimately save us money down the road. And so I want to say thank you to all of you who have supported that crossing over campaign. I lift that up this morning for a specific reason, because the focus of that campaign was a passage from Joshua, the fourth chapter. And that's our focus text this morning. If you remember, the Israelites found themselves as slaves in Egypt. And God called forth Moses after hearing the cries of the people and led them out of Egypt and through the Red Sea and into the wilderness experience. And from there, they got to the Jordan River. Forty years had passed. They got to the Jordan River and they crossed over into the promised land. But it's right there at the Jordan River that we pick up the story here in Joshua 4. I invite you now to hear these words. When the entire nation had finished crossing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, select 12 people from the community, one from each tribe, and command them to do this. Take 12 stones from here, out of the middle of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet stood, Carry them over with you and lay them down in the place where you will camp tonight. Then Joshua summoned the twelve people, the twelve from the Israelites whom he had appointed, one from each tribe. Joshua said to them, pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. And each of you take up a stone on your shoulder 
one for each of the tribes of the Israelites, so that this may be a sign among you. So that when your children ask in time to come, what do those stones mean? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off in front of the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters from the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the Israelites a memorial forever. The Israelites did as Joshua commanded. They took up 12 stones out of the middle of the Jordan according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites. As the Lord told them, they carried them over to the place where they camped and laid them down there. May ancient stories inspire our current living, inspiring us to live lives of faithfulness, justice, and compassion. Let us pray. May we receive your message, O oh God. May we receive your message of grace and forgiveness. It doesn't come as a trickle or a drop here or there, but as a deluge that is being poured over our lives, being poured into our lives. We offer these words. In the name of the triune God, amen. There is something about water. A number of years ago, my family took a vacation to Colorado. We rented a cabin for three nights in a wonderful valley, and just behind the cabin was this beautiful stream. And I remember getting up the very first morning we were there, just after sunrise and going and sitting next to that stream, taking in everything it had to offer, the sights, the sounds, they enticed my senses. And something as I sat there forced me to go and touch the water, to take off my sandals and put my feet in the cool water. I, I use that word forced somewhat hesitantly, but, but I know no other way of describing the allure of the water. There is something about water. My good friend David Merrick, who died a few years ago, he and his wife Carol had a daughter named Lily. Lily was born with what is called Rett syndrome. She developed normally up until about age two and then stopped and act actually regressed a little bit. She could not speak. She was confined to a wheelchair. And as she got older, she was often frustrated by her inability to express herself. There was one thing that David knew he could do. He would take her to a park close to their home where there was this large pool of water and in the middle of it a fountain that shot 12, 15 feet up into the air. And Lily would just watch the water and the fountain. It's the way light shined and the, and the sound that it made and she would smile and giggle. And, and David said that that time there next to the fountain brought peace to both of them. There is something 
about water. In Psalm 78, we find a retelling of the Exodus story. That story of the people being liberated out of their bondage in Egypt. But it is told in the poetry of the Psalms. It says this, The Lord worked marvels in the land of Egypt. The Lord divided the sea and let the people pass through it and made the waters to stand like a heap. The Lord split rocks open in the wilderness and gave the people water abundantly as from the deep. The Lord made streams come out of the rocks and caused water to flow down like rivers. The water was for the people a doorway to freedom. The water was the sustenance of life that was given to them in the desert. The water became for them an image of God's power to deliver, to sustain. It became an identifying mark upon their lives. There is something about water. In the story from Joshua, again, understanding that this is the time in which the people have been liberated out of Egypt. They have passed through the Red Sea, spent 40 years in the wilderness where God provided water from rocks, water from what appeared incapable of producing water. And then God led them after 40 years to the edge of the Jordan the edge of the promised land, the land that had been promised to Abraham and Sarah centuries earlier. They are finally there. They pass through it. And then Joshua is told to go back and have an individual, one from each tribe, to pick up a rock from the riverbed and to take it to the place where they were to camp, to stack up those rocks, to make a place of remembrance so that when their children or their children's children would ask, what are these rocks about? It would be the, the catalyst for telling the story. A story not just about their crossing the Jordan into the promised land, but the entire story from Egypt to the wilderness to the promised land. A story that is filled with images of water. There is something about water. But let me suggest that most of us in today's world go through life never appreciating the power and the implications of that very simple word, water. Unlike those in the ancient world, we do not understand what it really means. We might even say there's nothing special about water. Part of the problem is our easy access to water. And not just in a trickle, not a drop here, drop there, but water that comes to us with such abundance. And even here in Texas, when we have a little drought, our lawns might get a little brown. We might have to cut our showers by 30 seconds every day, but we don't suffer. We don't know what it's like to be fearful when it, came to, when it comes to access to water. Of course, just over a week ago, migrants in the back of a semi-trailer Ten of them died. Dozens more nearly died because of the heat and a lack of water. It's just something our culture doesn't usually understand. And when lead showed up in the waters of Detroit, especially the waters that came to those who were poor or people of color. There were some that dismissed the whole problem altogether. It was as if they just were saying, it's just water. It should be easy to get access to it. We don't have the same concepts, the same understanding of what water meant 
back in ancient Israel or even in the time of Jesus. We don't have the same concerns. We don't understand what it meant to wander in the wilderness, hoping, believing that God would provide and yet still having a little anxiety. Water was for them a divine gift of life. But along with being an essential gift for daily living, it, it represented the many stories of the faithful who were on a journey. Water not only provided life for the body, but was a living metaphor, a living story carrying with it a people's identity. That's important to know. That's important to know as we travel many years up to the point when John the Baptist shows up on the scene. Because as Mark's gospel tells it, John appeared in the wilderness, an important word to note, because there was another time when the people were in the wilderness. John shows up in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. A baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. The Greek word that we translate as for, the preposition F-O-R, the Greek word is ace. And yes, it is translated here quite often as for, but most often in the New Testament, it is translated as either into or toward. John is saying this is a baptism of change that moves us toward the release of our sins. That word carries with it motion and flow. There is something life-giving about the movement that is felt when you understand what that word is all about. And that was so important for a people that were in the desert, people that were in the wilderness. If water was still, it would become stagnant and would become dangerous. You looked for living water, flowing water, and the way Mark tells the story there is flow to it. And you find yourself in a beautiful and creative way being caught up in what I can only describe as storied imagery. Not only was a person surrounded by water there in the Jordan, but surrounded by the stories that were brought forth by just touching the water. Our denominational founders said that grace and forgiveness, the grace and forgiveness of God were mediated through baptism. Baptism helped the disciple to enjoy God's gifts of grace and forgiveness, not, not to procure them. Baptism allowed for the disciple to experience these gifts, not to earn them. It allowed for the disciple to get caught up in them, not to obtain them. Baptism allowed for us to enjoy, experience, and to get caught up in the grace and forgiveness that is not only somehow mediated through the water, but is caught up in the stories that we find throughout Scripture that are connected to the water. Why baptism? There is something powerful about the water. There is something important about the water. When we have a baptism, a baptism in our baptistry. Yes, the individual steps into those waters and that person is laid back into the waters and lifted up out of the waters. But it's not just about that moment. It is about connecting that individual to the stories of grace and forgiveness that are continually told in and through our God. Stories of grace and forgiveness that often just a touch to the water and we are remembering them. There is something 
about water. When I was growing up, I would often visit my grandparents, and in three of their bedrooms, they had a pitcher and basin set, three different sets. The one in the room that I often stayed in was very similar to this one, though the bowl was a little smaller. I thought they were just decoration. I didn't understand what they were for. But one day I asked my grandmother, and she began to tell me the story. You need to understand, she was born in 1899. She, in her early 20s and 30s, had been in western Nebraska during the Dust Bowl. She remembers, as those in Kansas and Oklahoma and even here in Texas, remember seeing the clouds of dust moving toward them. You would shut up your house, but it didn't matter. The dust would find its way in. She said every morning they would get up when the dust had settled. They would go out to the pump because there was no water or running water in the house. They would take the pitcher. They would fill it up. They would bring it into the bedroom and place a quilt over the pitcher and the basin. They would go about their daily tasks. The dust would blow, and they wouldn't even realize, my grandmother said, just how dirty they had become until later that day when they would take their clothes off, and there would be a line on their skin where their clothes stopped, and they would see just how much dirt. But my grandmother, being the good teacher that she is, told the story, not just verbally, but she went and she filled up the pitcher, and she poured the water into the basin, and she talked about how at the end of the day, removing that quilt and taking her dirty hands and putting them into the water and washing herself, taking a cloth and washing her face, and how powerful and refreshing that experience was for her. And though it wasn't my story, even though I had been born decades after the Dust Bowl in her telling and allowing me to see it and to touch the water in that moment, that story began to become my story because I understood the power and the meaning that it had for her life. There is something about water. Bishop Will Willimon, a bishop in the United Methodist Church, before he was a bishop, was the dean of the chapel at Duke University. And Will Willimon tells of one day while he was in the chapel office getting a phone call from the father of a student. And the father starts out with a very angry tone It's your fault! It's your fault! Wilmon, a little confused, says, what do you mean? It's, it's my fault. I, I don't understand. It's your fault. We sent our daughter to Duke to get a degree as a mechanical engineer, and now, a few months from graduation, her plan is to join the Presbyterian volunteer missionaries and go to Haiti and dig ditches. Now, Wilmon, trying to break the tension, tries to be humorous and says, oh, I know her well, and I'm sure she didn't learn anything about ditch digging and mechanical engineering school, but she was a fast learner. I'm sure she'll do very well digging ditches. The father was not impressed with his comments, said, it is your fault. It's your fault that she's doing this. And Willimon got very serious and said, no, sir, it is your fault. What do you mean, he said. Were you not the one that had her baptized, he said, remembering that both in the Methodist and the Presbyterian tradition, you're baptized as an infant? Were you not the one who took her to Sunday school? Were you not the one who got her to confirmation class where she embraced her baptism? Were you not the one that every summer made sure that she went to church camp? Well, yes, he said, but our hope was just to make her a good Presbyterian, to which Willimon said, there's your problem. 
when you had her baptized, you started her on a journey, a journey of discipleship. Because there's something about the water. It's not just about that moment of baptism. It's about being caught up in the flow of God's story of grace and forgiveness, a story that is told over and over and over again throughout the scriptures, a story about our God who helps us find a way, a God who does not leave our side, a God who continues to provide for us these great gifts of grace and forgiveness. And sometimes all it requires is for us to touch the waters and to find ourselves being touched by the waters and touched by the stories that they tell us. For there are so many stories about God's grace and forgiveness that are rooted in, of all things, water. There is something about water. You join me in prayer. Water. Oh God of all creation, you have gifted us with water, with life-sustaining water. But there is power to water that we so often in our current culture seem to ignore, seem to dismiss. There is power because there is a richness to to water and the stories that it tells. Help us this day to connect not only with the story of baptism, but the power of water and the way it communicates to us your grace and forgiveness. Give us opportunities to touch the water, to, to look upon the water, to hear the movement of the water, and to be inspired by what it communicates to us about your grace, about your forgiveness. For in and through the water, you have brought healing and transformation. You have sustained a people. You have delivered a people. And it is what you continue to do in our midst. May the waters of baptism, may our regular encounters with water be a reminder of who you are and what you are about so that our eyes might be open, that our ears might be made available, that we might come to enjoy and experience and to be enveloped by those powerful stories. We offer these words In the name of the one who described himself as living water, Jesus Christ, the one who taught us to pray by saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Over the last few weeks as I was preparing for this sermon, I was doing some research and I came across a couple of different articles that talked about our founders, two of them, Thomas Campbell, Alexander Campbell, father, son, and about their experiences, their transformation as they begin to struggle with an old faith community that made communion and baptism gates through which people had to pass, but gates that were guarded by the tradition where some were told you are welcome and others were not welcome. And as a part of that transformation in their own lives, Thomas and Alexander made the decision, along with the rest of their families, to experience baptism by immersion, to go down to the river and to have someone lay them back into the waters and to have that experience for themselves. Now, what I found fascinating in these two articles that I read, written just over the last couple years, People who had read through Thomas and Alexander talking about that experience, and these two individuals both said that Thomas and Alexander's baptism there when they were immersed was not a real baptism. They said that they did not quite do baptism correctly. They were close, but they didn't quite do it right. And then both of them in these articles suggested that both Thomas and Alexander Campbell are not in heaven because they didn't quite do baptism correctly. That image of God, of a God that is so nitpicky about making sure that baptism is done a specific way, if that is the way God is, if God is that nitpicky, we're all in trouble, folks. But this is about a God of grace and forgiveness, about a God who has gifted us with this thing we call baptism, an opportunity for us to touch the waters, to enjoy the grace and forgiveness that is shared there, to be caught up in the movement of God's grace and forgiveness that flow around us in the waters, whether it is in the baptistry or just a day when we're playing out in the river, being touched by what is happening in and around us. There is something about the water. Sometimes just touching it allows us to be touched by its power. And today, as you are coming forward for communion, I'm going to invite you, if you wish, to reach into the basin and to touch the water. And if you wish to make a mark of the cross upon your own forehead or maybe on the back of your hand, to touch the water and to be reminded of not just your baptism maybe, but to be reminded of all the ways that God's grace and forgiveness find their way into our lives. How water is one of the great mediators of that marvelous gift. And if you're unable to come forward, I invite you at the close of the service to have somebody come down and to pull out of of the bowl a little rock that will still be damp, and to give it to you as a reminder of how water wasn't just used by God in one moment of one time, but is continually used to communicate a grace and forgiveness that is always there, that is always being gifted to us. Let us now prepare for time at the table. With all of his disciples, he took the bread and blessed it 
and gave it to them saying, my friends, this is my body which is broken for you and all of you are welcome here. You are welcome. Welcome to this holy table. Yes, you are welcome. You are welcome here. Later on, he took the cup, give thanks, and had them drink it. This covenant of love is new. You must now remember, whenever you drink, eat this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim my death until I come again. You are welcome. Welcome to this holy table. Yes, you are welcome. As we prepare to celebrate communion, we know that all are welcome to this table. If this is your first time to participate with us, we receive communion by intention. We take the bread and we dip it into the cup. If you're unable to come forward in just a moment, please raise your hand. The elements will be brought to you. And if you desire gluten-free elements, they are available to you down and to my left. When you come, don't forget to bring the blue cards and any offerings that you may be wishing to share this morning. Now let us be mindful of the inner presence of God's Spirit and the life-giving power of God's presence within each one of us, likened to a subterranean river or a hidden spring. May we open our hearts to the flow of eternal life and love that we may be channels of God's grace and goodness to all we meet. Let us pray. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Heavenly Father, we do rejoice that we can come to this table and take this cup and this bread in remembrance of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who willingly laid down his life to pay for our sins. Lord, we, from this cup and this, and this bread, please help us to take increased devotion to him, to strengthen our faith, to fill us more with his spirit. Lord, he is the living water. We know that. And those that drink from him will never thirst. Be with us, Lord. Bless us, guide us, direct us, and help us to be more like you want us to be. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The scriptures tell us that on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and having prayed and blessed it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Likewise, he took the cup, again praying and blessing. He said, take this and drink. This is my blood, my life in the new covenant. The scriptures remind us of what Jesus said. As we celebrate this communion, we do this in remembrance of him.
Jordan. Deep river, Lord. I want to cross over into camp ground. Oh, don't you want to go to that gospel feast, that promised land, where all is peace? Oh, deep river, Lord, I want to cross over into camp Dear Heavenly Father, we bring these gifts and these offerings to you today. We lay them before you on this altar. Please bless them. Help us to do what is meaningful to you and be with us as we go through the following weeks that we can continue to bring these beautiful gifts and offerings to you. In Jesus' name, amen. At both the 8.15 and 9.30 services, I serve communion. And at both of those services, I got a little tickled as people would come forward for communion and they'd have water dripping down their forehead and across. There's something about seeing that water. I love on Sundays when we have a baptism and after the baptism has occurred, the candidate gets changed and comes down and sits in the sanctuary but his or her hair is still wet from the experience. 
there is something about the water. There's something that it does that evokes experiences, and many of them very powerful. And as people of faith, there is a plethora of stories that are about God's ability to work in and through the water to share forgiveness and grace. May it continue to be a means by which God allows you to enjoy, experience, and to be caught up in not only the stories, but in the power behind those stories, power that reveals the grace and the forgiveness. Here at Cypress Creek Christian Church, we extend every Sunday an invitation an invitation to join a community of faith because that is so important as people of faith. But most importantly, to connect one's life to Jesus Christ. If you wish today to make that decision, you can either come forward as we are singing or you can meet with one of our elders or pastors out in the lobby at the close. Let us now join our voices in our closing hymn.
As those who have waded in the water, we know that there is something about water. May we take the experience of the water out from this place and do as my grandmother did. Don't just tell the stories of the water, but fill something up. Allow people to feel the splash. Allow for them to touch it. Allow them to be caught up in the flow and movement of God's grace and forgiveness. The Spirit will help you. The Spirit will guide you and allow you to be an invitation to others so that they too will touch the waters and be touched by the stories that are found in the waters. I invite you to take the hand of someone close and let us be joined together in our closing prayer that will hopefully be on the screen in just a moment. There it is. Gracious God, may your love and our lives come together in a life lived in love. May Jesus be our mentor and our model, and may the world see in us a life that is willing to put love first in all things. Amen.